Welcome to Achieving Your Goal, Toolset 1, Taking Action and Tracking Progress. Having set your goal using the five-step technique described in the Goal Setting Toolset, you'll need to start work on your first sub-goal. This toolset provides you with a technique that can help you to take action, as well as three ways in which you can manage the progress you're making with your goal. This toolset consists of this presentation together with a prompt list for helping you to start and then manage your goals. In this presentation, we'll look at how implementation intentions can help you take action when you need to either start a sub-goal or maintain your progress. We'll also review three techniques for managing and tracking your progress. An implementation intention, first devised by the psychologist Peter Golvitzer, is a mental plan that involves saying the following to yourself. If situation X is encountered, then I will do Y in order to achieve my sub-goal Z. The letter X is a cue and could be a specific date or time of day, an event or particular circumstance. Here's an example of an implementation intention. If I see Jane, then I will ask her for the number of her personal trainer so that I can achieve my sub-goal of starting a fitness programme. Peter Golvitz's research has found that implementation intentions are useful when we need to overcome one or more of the following reasons for failing to take action. We forget to take action. We fail to grasp the opportunity to take action when it arises. We have second thoughts at the critical moment. For example, we order the fried chicken instead of green salad when trying to lose weight. We get derailed by enticing stimuli, such as the television being on when we're about to start studying. We get derailed by our habits, for instance, wanting to get up at 5am when we're not normally awake until 7am. Our negative self-state, such as a bad mood or feeling distressed. And expecting a negative effect as a consequence of taking action. For example, we're afraid of booking our next driving lesson because we find learning to drive stressful. An implementation intention consists of an if statement followed by a then statement. Writing it down, it looks like this. If situation X is encountered, then I will do Y. Research shows that this if-then sentence structure has a direct and positive effect on the likelihood of our taking action. Here are some tips on how to form your own implementation intention. When defining the if, ask yourself, what has to happen in order for me to take action? Where will things have to happen in order for me to take action? And when will things have to happen in order for me to take action? Make sure that your answers are specific. For instance, if you intend on taking action in a specific place, have you named that place? Have you specified the exact time and day that you have in mind? With regard to the then, ask yourself, how will I take action? And who else needs to be involved when I take action? Again, be as specific as you can. Know exactly how you will take action and who else might be involved. When you first start creating implementation intentions, you might want to use and complete a table such as the one found in the prompt sheet to check if your answers are specific enough when addressing each of the if and then questions. If you'd like to know more about implementation intentions, why not watch the Doing Toolset 1 presentation in the Confidence Toolkit. Tracking your progress as you work through the sub-goals and tasks that make up your goal has three benefits. It provides motivation. It feels good to see the progress we're making and this feeling provides us with the incentive to continue pursuing our goal. It provides information that helps us to take back control. Tracking our progress lets us know when our progress is not what we want it to be and helps with deciding what needs to be done to get ourselves back on track. And it increases our chances of success. A review by Robert Mazzano of 14 different studies showed that those students who track their academic progress 
demonstrated a 32% improvement in their performance compared to those students who didn't. Tracking your progress is a visual way of answering the question, how am I doing? Tracking can take three forms. Lists, graphs and motivational chains. The most common list used is a to-do list. To-do lists include lists of tasks and these lists can be organised in different ways. A random list of unrelated tasks. A list of unrelated tasks to be worked through in some kind of order. Or a structure or outline which involves breaking down tasks into smaller pieces or subtasks. To-do lists work by helping us to remember what needs doing. When we make a list, and especially when we place a date or time next to each task, we're more likely to complete it. Crossing out or ticking an item on our list when we've completed it creates a pleasant feeling, which is caused by the release of dopamine, which activates the pleasure and reward centres of the brain. This release of dopamine, and the sensation that it causes, motivates us to move on to the next item on our list so that we can experience that high again. The best times to create a to-do list are when you're deciding what needs to be done to complete your sub-goals, before leaving work or before going to bed, or as soon after you get up or just before you start work. Graphs A graph is a great way to track our progress over the time that we have set ourselves for completing our goal, sub-goal or task. A graph has two axes an x-axis and a y-axis. The convention is for time to be plotted along the x-axis. The thing that we want to track is plotted on the y-axis. Graphs can take different forms. For instance, if we wanted to lose 30 pounds in three months, the graph we plot might look like this. Where the gradient of the slope is downwards because we're losing weight and the x-axis covers a period of three months. We might mark on the graph what our target weight might be after three months. If we were working to accumulate a total of 240 hours of teaching in a year, in order to get our teaching qualification, the graph might look like this. where the gradient of the slope is upwards and the x-axis covers all the months in an academic year. Sometimes we may want to maintain a consistent performance in order to achieve our goal. For example, imagine your goal is to write a novel. Since one of the rules of developing writing skills is to write every day, you decide to write 300 words a day, every day. You then plot the following graph to measure your progress against this task. Here, the red line describes the 300 words a day you've set yourself, and the blue line shows how well you're keeping to this task. Another type of line that we can plot, before we actually start tracking our progress, is a plan of our intended progress. Imagine that you need to save £1,200 over the next 12 months and you decide that you will save £100 a month. Now, you could either plot a line similar to the 300 words a day or you could draw a graph that looks like this. Where the red line represents the total amount of savings, our target, that we would have at the end of each month. When we plot the actual amount of money we have saved, we can see how we're performing against what we plan to have accumulated for that month. Plotting a graph not only helps us to understand the progress that we're currently making, it can also help with predicting our future performance. Take a look at this graph, which describes the weekly accumulation of 200 training hours that are required before being allowed to sit an exam. The shape the line creates can tell us what has happened in the past. For instance, the flatness here. This was due to the winter break and no classes being run. The front end of the line can also tell us what might happen in the future. Notice how during the last three weeks the line has stopped rising so sharply. 
This could be a possible trend, a slowing down in the number of hours being accumulated. Now while there may be a good reason for the slowdown, the graph helps us see whether or not we'll meet our target if we continue accumulating hours at this rate, and whether or not we need to take action to get things back on track. As a general rule of thumb, look at the last three to five data points of your graph for a trend. When it comes to plotting a graph, you can use pen and paper, ideally graph paper, or a spreadsheet program such as Excel or the open source and free Calc. Whatever you use, make sure your graph is in a place that's visible so that it acts as a reminder of how you're doing. For instance, if you're trying to lose weight, you might want to attach your graph to the refrigerator. Or if your goal is work-related, you might pin your graph to the wall of your cubicle or next to your computer. Place your graph where you're most likely to be thinking about your goal or need reminding about it. When it comes to deciding how often to measure your progress, you need to consider the longest acceptable period between measurements. For example, if you're trying to lose weight, the convention is to weigh yourself weekly due to the daily fluctuations in our weight. A week, therefore, is the longest acceptable period between measurements. If you're looking to save some money and you're making a regular deposit in a savings account each month, the longest acceptable period between measurements would therefore be a month. And in the case of writing 300 words a day, the longest acceptable period between measurements is, you guessed it, a day. Motivation chains. Sometimes our goal is to create a new habit, something that we want to do regularly, preferably without having to think about it and with the minimum of willpower. Imagine for a moment that your goal is to write a novel. As mentioned earlier, you'll receive the advice to write every day. One way of motivating yourself to do this is to get a hold of a year planner and to cross out a day at the end of each writing session. After a few days, a chain of crosses will form. As the chain grows, and on those days when you do not feel up to writing, the thought of breaking that chain of crosses you created will motivate you to sit down and write. While motivation chains can be used to track those things that we want to do, such as exercising or studying, they can also be used for tracking those things that we want to give up or stop doing, such as not smoking or not eating certain kinds of foods. Motivation chains work by helping us to take action each day. When we take action consistently, the thing that we aspire to gets easier until we no longer have to consciously apply ourselves, since that regular action or behaviour has become a habit. Achieving our goal involves taking action. Implementation intentions are a powerful tool for helping us to do this. Keeping to-do lists, plotting our progress using graphs, and creating motivation chains are three ways of managing our progress so that with regular and consistent action, we reach our desired goal. <laughs>